let's start by since so few of you have been using ha Harmony before, I'll just start by showing a quick introduction to the workspace. I won't show everything about the workspace just because during the presentation there's more that I'll that I'll introduce you to. So first off, um, well, here's the workspace. I've kind of modified it a little bit to fit my taste, but basically any little tab that you see here is a window. So you can click on anything and go into that window and all those windows, you can rearrange them as you please as well. So just so you know, your workspace is fully customizable. We might actually try and make the, the, your screen a bit bigger and turn off our video. Can we do that? Sure. Because on our screen here, it's not uh, showing up quite large enough. Yeah. I've turned off my webcam. Yeah, great. Yeah, OK. All good. And they're just turning off another light as well, because um, okay. that's perfect. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> OK, you're, you're good to go, Matisse. All right, so um, Thanks. My, here's my camera window. This is basically where I'll be seeing everything that's in my scene and everything that I should be able to see. I'll get into that a bit later. On the left side, you can see the main drawing toolbar and under it, the animation toolbar. And on top, you have many more toolbars that you can have as well by just right clicking and bringing up any toolbar. I'll be doing that during the presentation. Under it, you can see the timeline. So the timeline is something that you see in pretty much any animation softwares. I'll get into the way it works a bit later. Something that you don't usually see in a 2D animation software is a node view. So basically this is, I don't know how many of you actually have ever used 3D softwares, but it's more common in those. A node view basically will show every single element in your scene as a node, so a little box like that. And it will each little box can be connected to something else. And the fact that you can draw connections out of a box like that allows you to do very complex rigs or compositing it just allows you, it gives you a lot more freedom. So I'll be, I definitely recommend using the node view. Just so you know, we have three editions. We have essential, advanced, and premium. And the node view is only available in the premium version. The premium version is also definitely the best um, bang for your box uh, edition of the software. You get everything in it. So let's go ahead and I will show you something that is that was done um, in a paperless fashion so traditional animation drawn directly in the software you may recognize this production it's called urbens and um it was i think it's a european production it's quite nice uh they released their their first few episodes, I think, but I'm not actually sure, but there's definitely the trailer online. Check it out. Um, so with this, what I want to show you is, I'll actually go into the group of this, and I want to show you kind of the pipeline, the steps that you'll go through when you create paper less animation inside the software. So first off, you'll start with a rough layer. So I'll call this a drawing layer. So drawing layers will also show up in the timeline as well as in the node view. And if I was to look at this drawing layer, I see it here. So when a drawing layer is shown in the timeline, you can see that when it's filled with a drawing, it's a little gray box that appears. So you can see that there's quite a bit of drawings in here, and that is because all of the the animation has been drawn and sketched out. Now, in Harmony, you can draw with both vector and bitmap um, brushes. So you can create both vector and bitmap art. In this case, this rough sketch is done with on a bitmap drawing layer. 
And you can even combine bitmap and vector on one drawing layer, which I can demonstrate later on. Then you would go into doing the cleanup. So using, we basically have two main tools. We have the brush tool and the pencil tool. This one was done using the brush tool. So it's basically the same thing as in Flash. So the brush tool is a shape that has vector points around it, uh, allowing you to create thick and thin. Although you can also create thick and thin with the pencil line and I prefer using the pencil. So in here, they've been, I'll just show you the colors as well. So they've been using the black outline and the red color to um, designate areas that would be uh, colored lines and then the blue color to designate areas that would have shadows. And after that, if I show the final version, that's pretty much the result that you get. Now, the good thing about the way we handle colors is that basically any swatch that you see here, well, first off, you can have multiple palettes inside a, uh, one scene, and each palette has its own colors in it. And each swatch is actually a number, so it's a color ID, and you're basically painting a number inside a zone. So, because of this, you've then um, associated a color to that number. And since it's not a color but a number that's painted, it means that I can change the color of my number at any time during my production. And anywhere where that color was used, well, that number was used, the color will be updated. So this has saved a lot of time on a lot of productions especially when you deal with clients that all of a sudden decide to change colors while you've already animated a couple of episodes or something like that. So you can just quickly change it in one scene and the changes will be applied to the whole production. Something else that you can do with the palettes that is pretty nice is create a, I'll first create a clone. And let's say that I want to create a nighttime palette for my character. Well, it's very easy. I don't even have to really uh, wonder how the yellow will turn out in a bluish light. So I can actually use the tint panel, which will allow me to select colors that I want to modify, select the amount by which I'll modify them, and apply some modifications to them. So I can tweak things around. Uh, you have three different ways to play with the tint panel. I won't go into each, each of them. I'll just hit apply. And now the palette that I've created, Urban Night, always has these, those colors in it. And I can go back to my daytime palette, which is just the regular Urban one. Um, something else that I'll go in more details later on is that on this on this uh, animation, so they've used the brush uh, the brush tool, and they've also painted directly on the same art layer. As you can see, we have four art layers as the line. And right now, I'm going to demonstrate another example, which you've actually seen in the presentation. So it's this girl here. And let me just extend the length of the scene by just pulling this bracket. All right. Okay. So this character here jumps from building to building, grabs a pole, and then jumps on the Harmony TV, whoops, I kind of went too fast, and goes behind it. And this is all paperless animation. So let me get into it. And let's 
grab the girl. All right. Okay. So in this case, she's been drawn with lines, the line tool, the pencil line tool. And the difference between the brush and the pencil line is the where the vector is placed. And so the brush, the brush is a zone with the vector points around it, whereas the, the pencil line has the vector in the middle of it, which makes it easier to play with the handles and just modify the curve. All right, so um, I'll go into how to paint this character. All right, so I have a few frames of the character that have not been uh, painted. I guess I just have one in this case. I'll show you. So we have a couple different painting tools. And instead of painting the colors directly onto the same art layer as um, the lines, I'll just paint them in the color art. Now, the thing at the moment is that there's no zone for me to paint in. They're all on the line art. So I'll create the zones by just clicking on a little icon here, create color art from line art which will basically see all of the zones that are, all of the lines that are created on the line art, put them on the color art, but with no thickness. And this will allow me to go and paint in the character. So I can then just apply some colors. Now this may seem like a long process, but it actually, isn't really because of some tools that um, some painting tools that come with the software basically so now there's zones that are not closed which is why I cannot fill in but let me just go and show you how to use the other painting tools so right now I was just using the regular paint bucket but something that I can do is, let me just see. All right, so here's my art layer with all my little drawings. As you can see, the coat is not painted for a couple of drawings. And I'll go ahead and paint it. And I don't have to actually paint it on every single drawing one by one. I could use something, an option that would apply the paint to multiple drawings that are exposed on my timeline. And instead of using just the regular paint tool, I'll just use the pen. Can, can you just repeat that last part? We lost you for like two seconds. Oh, sure. Um, so basically, instead of having to paint one by one each of my drawings, yeah. I'll be able to use uh, something that is called apply to multiple drawings it's in the tool properties of the paint bucket. Basically the tool properties window adapts what is shown in it to whatever tool you're on. And what I'll do here, so as you can see, there's about four or five layers, uh, drawings that don't have the hoodie painted. And what I'll do is use the paint unpainted, which means that it's only gonna fill in areas that have not been painted previously. So I can just circle like this. And I just did this on one drawing, but because I was using this little additional function, all of this uh, subsequent uh, drawings have been filled as well. So there's definitely a way to do your ink and paint very fast in the software. You also have the repaint and unpaint options if you want to. And as far as having colored lines, well, we have something that's called ink, and I could just pick whatever and go over the lines that I want to paint, and you'll see that they've been painted. So it's very easy. Even if the colors were painted on the same art layer as uh, the lines, I would be able to use the ink 
the ink tool and not paint in um, the fills, but really just the lines. Now, that's possible only with the pencil line. And something else that's very useful is, as you can see, there's quite a bit of thick and thin in this character. So you might think that you have to create this thick and thin by hand. But what I could do is actually, at first, create the line and adjust the thick and thin using the pencil editor, which is here. You can select it modify the, the tips, modify any point. I can create additional points and modify the thickness. But once that's done, I can also select my line, go into the tool properties, and create a new thickness stencil for that line. So by doing so, the new thickness stencil that I just created is here at the bottom of the list. And this allows me to, let's say, select all of the lines that I would like to apply this thickness to. Just select it and you might have seen that the lines have changed a little bit. So if I do it again from up close, you'll see that the same thickness and variation that one that the line that I selected and created the thickness pencil from has been applied everywhere on the drawing. Now as far as painting. Some people like to have um, painting styles or uh, drawing styles that don't, that don't have closed zones. So lines that aren't really closed but can be filled with color. And that's possible to do as well with a function that's called um, auto close gap. And I'll just close this one. But without having the lines touching, I can uh, fill in my area. Now, something else that's pretty useful with the pencil tool is that you can add textures to your line. So by just selecting one, I can go back to my tool properties, and at the bottom, you have a couple of textures that come with the software. Just be aware that you can actually create your an unlimited amount of textures um, you just need to have them saved as a PSD or a TGA file, and then you'll be able to import them and use them. So any of your favorite texture brushes from Photoshop, you just have to make a PSD out of them and import them. Now I've just made those lines textured, and because they are uh, pencil lines, the texture will follow along the path of the line very nicely. Okay. Um, all right. Something else that we can see in the timeline is that some of the little drawings here, let me just zoom in a little bit. Some of the drawings have dots on them, colored dots. And that is because I can actually mark drawings as keys or breakdowns or in betweens. So by to do so, I'll just bring in my mark drawing toolbar, and I'll show you what it looks like in the X sheet. So if you're a fan of the X sheet, know that you have it in the software. And as you can see, I've already marked this drawing as a key. So it shows up as a red K letter. If I go to another drawing here and just mark it for you, can press on K and you see that it's been marked. Now, what marking allows you to do is, of course, uh, go through your animation quickly and um, understand what those drawings represent and just you know keep track of your keys and breakdowns, so your major drawings, but also flip in between only the keys or only the breakdowns or how, whatever you want. So basically, I'll just bring in the flip toolbar and by selecting uh, what I want to flip in between of, like this, and then using the shortcuts F and J, uh, G, sorry, this will allow me, as you can see, to just drum from key to key. If I want to add the breakdowns in that, 
So it's very easy. And then if I was to add the in-betweens, well, of course, I would just be jumping from uh, basically drawing to drawing. And if everything is unselected, that's also what you're doing. OK, let's go to the render view. Because at the moment, we are working in the open GL view. So it is represented here by the little gray flower. And the OpenGL view is where you'll be working um, to quickly uh, see what your scene looks like and also be able to play back your animation in real time. But if we go to the render, the soft render view, you'll see what your animation will look like um, when you, you're going to render it. Let me just bring in a color card. Oh yeah, this one is really far. Okay. All right, so what you can also see is that my character has highlights and tones. So these were actually drawn, but we also use uh, effects modules to create those shadows and highlights. So let me show you the drawings. As you can see, this is the those are the drawings for the lights. So they've all been drawn. So these are additional drawings, kind of the way you do them um, on paper. But then they go into a highlight module, which if I go into the render view, gives me different properties that I can modify. So this is very useful because I could decide that my highlights are actually going to be blurry. As you can see, maybe this is a bit too much. So I could have them blurry or not. I can also apply a color to them, so a shade. And anywhere where you see this little Bezier or handles icon means that this property is something that can actually be animated over time. So this means that over time, as, as a, my animation or my scene plays, I could have this color of the highlight change. Same thing for the tones as well. So if I go to, I think this is the tone. Let me check. Or do we even have tones in here? I don't think so. Yeah, just highlights in this case. All right, but we also have a tone module that basically acts exactly the same way, but will apply something that's a bit darker than your color instead of lighter. Okay. Now, with this method, you actually have to draw in the area that will be highlighted or um, will receive the tone, but you could also be using something else. So you'll see that I go back and forth into this library, which is pretty useful. This is a place where you can put templates of, let's say, backgrounds or character that you've rigged or just designed, props, anything. And you always have access to the same library in whatever scene you're in, whatever Harmony project you're in. And then you can drag things out of it. So I'll just drag another example. Now, let me check. OK. All right, so in this case, I have my character that I've cut into um, different drawing layers for to have a better looking um, tone. I'll show you. So if I was to go in the render view and reactivate the color card, you'll see that the shape here, I've actually not drawn it at all. I'm actually using a module that allows me to actually create a mat of whatever drawing is in it. And then I'm using a peg. The pegs are used to move things around. 
And so with this peg, I can decide where I'll be placing that mat. And this mat is then going into a tone module, which gives it this, well, tone aspect. And you can see that all the shadows are on the right side and not for this one, but I could switch it by just going into the tone and saying invert mat. And once again, everything here is um, animatable and you can change the color of it. All right. So I've mentioned that you can draw with um, bitmap and vector, but I've actually not really shown what bitmaps can look like. So practically everybody draws uh, their backgrounds in Photoshop but you could actually draw them here directly, so inside the software. Now let me make sure that I'll be able to see it. Okay, all right, so it's on the first frame, all right. Okay, so in here, I'm currently showing you a background that has been done for a game that I'll be demonstrating later. Part of this uh, background, part of the art layers are bitmap and other ones are vector. So let me just locate exactly the, back, the element that I'm on. All right, here it is. And if I was to go into the properties, you can see that the art layers, some are vector, and then the color art is bitmap. If I am to go on the color art, I can also know that I'm on the bitmap layer because the tools that only work with vector are grayed out. And so this was all done with bitmap brushes. This is kind of rough looking, but you can get an idea of uh, what you can create with it. We also just um, integrated the dual tip brushes for the bitmap brushes only so it does uh, what uh, it does basically in Photoshop so it allows you to mix two brushes together and manipulate each of them as you please now for for the ones of you who um, are working with flash you may wonder how easy it would be for you to transfer whatever you're working on in Flash in Harmony. It used to be kind of hard to do, but now we fixed that. So we have a very simple script that allows you to import your Flash assets. So I'll just go into Flash right now, and here's a character that I have. It has symbols inside symbols inside symbols, just like, Flash works, um, and by just going into Window, Extension, and Export to Harmony, this is there because I've added a script into Flash. We provide you with the script if you need it. And then once I'm in Harmony, what I'll do is use another script, which will import my asset. Now I just need to go and locate my asset, and for this one, I've put it kind of far, so let me just go in it. All right, here it is. Then I just need to locate a simple file, click open, and my whole character is gonna be imported in here with the whole hierarchy as well. So what you're seeing here is a rig that's been created out of um, the way that your symbols were created. So it will keep, it will recreate the same, the same type of hierarchy that you had in Flash and your pivot locations will be kept as well. 
So it allows me to go from, uh, I'm currently going up in my hierarchy. If you look at uh, what's happening here, I'm basically selecting one element, clicking on B, which goes from um, up in the hierarchy that is built directly uh, in Harmony. And I'll get into that more in detail as I go into the cutout side of things. Any questions so far? Is every, everything good? Any questions? No. All right. No. OK. So let's talk about cutout. I'll show you three different characters. One that is very simple. And once again, I'll make a comparison to Flash because I know a lot of people are using it as their uh, primary animation software. So in here, I have a little animation of my character. And just like I showed you that hierarchies exist, real hierarchies exist in, um, in Harmony without having to create symbols or go inside any other drawing. Well, I'll demonstrate that here as well. So by just selecting a drawing in my camera view and clicking on B, you can see that I can go up in my hierarchy, which allows me to quickly pose my character. Something else that's very different from Flash is that by just selecting a simple drawing, if you go into the library now, you can see that the library is actually divided in three, but um, the bottom and the right side of it are basically together, they access the files that are on your computer and the templates that you create. But the top part of it is the drawing substitution. And what that is, is basically it will contain all of the drawings that you've created for that specific uh, drawing layer. So in this case, the hand. So I will have all of my hand drawings in here, which once again, makes it very easy for me as an animator to pose, to pick the hand that I want, go in my hierarchy, pose my character, and just move on with the rest of the posing. Something else that we can see in this animation is that the character goes from profile to part of front. And you can do this in many ways. You could have two separate heads that would, uh, one for the profile, one for the part of front, etc. But in this case, we've done actually something that's uh, that gives you even more flexibility and more control over uh, your character and the animation of it. So if I am to select all of the facial features, you see that I can move them in the face. You can also see that they are being masked. I'll go into that in a few seconds. But by having them selected, you can also see that it's exactly the same features that are just moving towards the side of the, of the face and basically being cut by the face. So the nose obviously is not being cut for uh, having it in the visible in the profile. So that is very, very useful. Something else where somewhere else where we are using masks, um, we basically call mask cutters in this software. And we use them for the eyes or anything that has to be shown only in one area or be shown only outside of one area. They're quite easy to use. So you see the cutter here. And because it's currently inverted, it means that it's only showing through the mat that I've decided. And if I put it not inverted, it only shows outside. So. So even though having a real hierarchy is quite useful and having access to all of your drawings with the drawing substitution is great, this can still be a bit time consuming to animate this character because let's say that the torso has to bend. Well, I would have to redraw a new drawing for the torso uh, in the shape that I want it to be. So this brings me to introducing you to deformers. 
And the formers are basically, um, how could I put this? So it's really similar to 3D rigging. So you're actually putting bones. Um, the bones are just one type of deformers that we have in the software. But you're basically, I'll show you what a deformer looks like. So now I just made the torso def deformer appear. You can see uh, all the circles here are articulations. And basically, the drawing will bend around the articulation. You can also reshape the articulation, and this will modify the way the, the character or the part that has the deformer on it will bend. You can also see that it is applied to map texture around. So before the deformers existed, having texture on a character was a bit of a nightmare for the animators because as soon as that part that has texture on it would move, they would have to redraw it or modify it. Whereas now they just have to play with the deformers, which makes it way easier. So this is the bone deformer. Uh, the bone has the articulation. We also have put it on the arms. So maybe I should just show you this little animation. Now Can you I would make your screen a little bit a little bit yeah. brighter, Miss Heath. Brighter or bigger? Yeah, brighter. Oh yeah. Uh, let me check. Is that working? Is that the screen? No. Here. Is that better? It's pretty much the max I can go at. Okay, great, thanks. All right. Okay. Um, yeah. So this animation. Now I've just tweaked one pose, so the girl is, of course, twitching. Um, but it's all been done with deformers. So if I click on the arm, you can see that there's absolutely no drawing substitution. There's only one drawing in it. But yet it bends in many different ways. And so if I am to modify the size of the articulation, you'll see that it's going to affect. I don't have to worry about what you're seeing right now. It's completely normal. And you'll see that it's going to affect uh, the, the animation of it. So the bigger the articulation means the more bendy it, it can be the more bendy the part can be. So on something very small like an arm, it could uh, help me do something similar to rubber hose animation. Whereas if I was to have the articulation be very small, it would bend in a more uh, realistic way, so more angles. And this little uh, color, uh, I guess, bug or something. It's not really a bug. It's just the way that it gets uh, shown in the OpenGL view. If I was to go in the render view, you can see that the color is totally fine. Another deformer that we have is the curve deformer. So as you can see, the curve deformer doesn't have any articulation on it. So it allows you to uh, bend the the shape, the drawing, uh, without having a specific area from which it's going to bend. So you put this on something that is more organic or something that would have a very, very rubber, rubbery feel. So you could even put that on an arm if you wanted to. It just depends on the animation style that you're looking for. So this will save you a ton of redraw and quite a bit of time. So you could, if you were working on a flash production, you could import your flash production in Harmony and add those deformers on it and keep on going. Now what I'm going to show you is the last deformer that we currently have. And in order to do so, I'll just close this scene. So let me just delete this little thing. And I will open a scene that uh, you've, you've um, 
you've seen in the demo that was shown. It's the one with um, this little character here. So boom skating. And I'll show quite a bit of things in it. All right, so part of the things that I want to demonstrate is um, all the deformers that are on it, because there's quite a bit, actually. So this was done entirely in cutout, but because of the type of deformer that has been used on it, it can really get this uh, paperless feel. So it really looks like it's actually been drawn because of how it's been deformed and the skill of the artist that did it. Now, something else that I'm going to show with this uh, with this example is that I'm going to go into a bit of compositing. So I've talked about tones and highlights previously, and you can see quite a bit here. Whoops. But the thing that you don't know is that actually these were not drawn at all. And we've actually used a brand new feature called light shading which allows you to create a normal map for those of you who know what that is it's like um, creating volume it's basically applying a volumetric light onto a flat element so you can actually uh, play with the bevel of a flat object and create kind of a 3d surface out of it and then you can apply multiple light sources that will create those highlights and tones. So I'm going to show that. So here's my scene. And it's a little bit heavy because of the amount of deformers that are on it. But let me just show you a bit, a few of them. So I think that the hair is done with curved deformers, but now I'm showing the last deformer. So this one is called the envelope deformer. And with the name that it has, you can understand that it goes around a shape. So having it like that will allow you to modify every piece of the shape, which then allows you to really create that uh, paperless feel, right? Because you can basically play with the lines and the shape of the, the body part that you're playing with in any way. So basically every single body part in, in it has an a envelope deformer on it. This is what gives it its very uh, paperless feel. Now the good thing about using deformers instead of uh, drawing. I love drawing, don't get me wrong, I really love paperless. But something that can be quite useful is when you're working with um, uh, volumes, right? So you're always working vo with volumes when you're drawing. But when you're doing paperless, it can be easy to kind of lose track of the model of your character that you're drawing. Whereas when you are using uh, deformers, it's just as easy to lose track and maybe have a very puffy arm. But then what I can do is take my deformer group and set it back to what it was supposed to be. So this brings it back to the way that the drawing was originally uh, drawn. So I can always go back to a reference that has the proper volume. Now about the light shading, we're going to have a look at that. Okay. So here's my tone shader and the light that's associated with it. I can also show you the light position of it by just clicking on show controls. And if I was to go into my render view, just give me a couple seconds to render this frame out.
All right. And if I am to move that camera now, you'll see that the tones, not the highlights, but the tones are being modified a little bit. So it, in this case, it's kind of subtle, but uh, you can still see a change. And if I was to show the light shaders, so the ones that are used for the highlights, and here, you'll see that I'm able to really um, bring out a make the light source look different. And if I am to show you what a normal map looks like, well, that's basically what has been created out of our 2D asset. So it's quite impressive. And if I am to just isolate the character by itself, that's what you get. And basically the light, you can animate, you can have a, as many light sources as you please on even one asset or one character, one body part, anything, as many, of course, uh, light sources for the tones as well. And you can animate these positions throughout the scene so that they fit uh, to your own taste. Now we're going to keep on going with the compositing side of things. And as you may have noticed, in this scene, we have a 3D asset, which looks a bit weird at the moment. Um, just let me go back here. OK. All right. So in the software, you can import 3D assets, so FBX files. Um, I think we also support other kind of uh, 3D files, but I know the FBX works for sure. And so you can import it. And although in the video that I showed you, it looks, it still looks um, not rendered really because of the texture. And uh, you see that you still see the polygons and everything. So the reason for that is that the, uh, the machine that rendered this scene didn't have the Maya batch render on it. So a cool thing is that Maya can be quite expensive, but Maya batch render is free. So, and it's actually all you need to be able to render your 3D assets. So this means that without having Maya, you could maybe use 3D assets provided by your friends or online and just have the Maya batch render. And once you're gonna do your, the render of your scene by doing this, export render write nodes, um, your 3D asset will still be rendered and fully so the texture will be applied and you'll see no uh, polygon or low res uh, 3D object anymore. Something else, let me just check how this scene has been built. All right, so I'm currently in the perspective view. And what I'm looking at is basically I'm in a 3D space of my scene. So Harmony really is, a, it's basically a 3D software structure, but works for 2D. And so as you can see, I can go around in my scene and you can see that the backgrounds are at different depth. And so of course this is possible because of the 3D space that exists inside the software. And this makes it very, uh, useful when you're doing a lot of things like scene planning and all that, but you um, when you're having camera moves, let's say that you want to do a, a multiplane, well, you just have to set elements at various depth, and while the camera travels, it's basically gonna uh, create the multiplane that you're looking for. So just like things move in real life, you're able to mimic this in the software. A lot of productions that are done in Flash actually are very limited in camera moves because of that. And I'm just gonna show you that you can actually have a camera module and add a peg on it. So you, you do have a real camera inside the software. And by just having a peg on it, now let me make sure that I don't select anything else. It means that I can just move my camera itself. I can have it zoom in, zoom out, whatever I want, whatever a camera will usually do, I can do with it. 
I can even set that camera to uh, be 3D. So by just going into the properties, enabling the 3D, and then this means that I can actually have my camera, I just, let me just bring the camera window here. So with my camera now, if I am to rotate it, you can see the result here in the camera view. Oops. All right, so you can just imagine the possibilities with it. Let me close this. Okay, and now I am going to show you particles. So we're still going on strong with the compositing side of things. I'll reopen the scene that I had previously. Did anyone have questions from that last bit? How's the pulse of the audience? Is it interesting? Is it not interesting? <laughs> I think they're alive. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. How, how many people have, um, have animated cutout before? OK, five. And, okay. and hand drawn? Okay, five is all. All right. Next. Yeah. And how many people do you have in the audience at the moment? I think about 10. All right. Sounds good. Okay. So what I'm showing you right now is a scene that has particles in it. And the particles in this scene are the rain falling and the rain landing on the sea. So this means that to do effects like this, you don't necessarily need to draw them out all the time. You can actually create a particle system that will render whatever drawing you would like. Um, and it's, it can get quite complex. And uh, by complex, I mean it. you can basically do anything you'd like. So let's have a look at this scene. You can see that the rain is falling. Now, once again, I'm not in the render view, so it's a low res version of uh, what the, sh the scene actually is like. Here's a high res version of it. Well, it's still a soft render, but it's better. Uh, it's closer to the result that you'd be getting. And let me just go into that a little bit. So in the node library, so node view, node library, the node library contains all of the different FX, um, all represented as nodes once you drag them in here, that you can use. And it's also split into sections for uh, to make it easier for you to use. So if you go into the particles, we have uh, particle examples. So we have particle examples, so things that are already set out for you to just import in your scene and look at and use. Uh, we have some basic nodes that you need and some additional, more advanced nodes that you'd be using to uh, modify your particle. So in here, if I am to just explain this a bit, I have a sprite emitter, which will uh, auto-populate drawings. Here's my little drawing layer drawings that I've previously drawn. So let's have a look at it in here. OK, this is pretty, very pale. But this is the splash, so the water just landing. And this means that you can actually create an animation and have the particles render this animation in the proper order, so the proper order of the drawings. So if I was to zoom in a little bit, you'd see that each little uh, land spot uh, will play the animation in the proper sequence. Whereas it's not necessarily the case for the rain that's falling. And you can also assign the region in which 
uh, the particles are being generated and uh, shown. I won't go into more details in this at the moment because I want to get going. Now something else that um, I'll finish with this before going to Storyboard Pro. Something else that people are really into lately and I think it's a major thing that will keep on going is games, right? So 2D games are really back to life. And so you can create all of your animation inside the software. Basically, uh, I already showed you the background uh, previously that was used for a game. And now I'm go just going to show you one animation of a character that has been created for that game. You might have seen it a little bit or not. So this is just an idle animation. So if I was to go at like the last frame that it's shown, have it stop there and I can loop it and I can press play. You won't see it at a proper render time just because of um, the connection that we're having and the platform that we, we are using, but it runs very smoothly. In this case, it's all been created with the formers, as you can see. And so this means that the game engine that we're using, which is Unity, um, it, it will read the deformers properly. So it will read only one kind of deformer properly, and it's the game, the game bone. So we've made one specifically for, for games. And it's very easy to render this out and send it to Unity. I won't show it in Unity, although I have it, um, just to save a bit of time. But I will show how you can export it. So let me just get my script. So you can basically export to a sprite sheet. And one of the things that we do very well is that instead of having to do multiple exports for the multiple resolutions that you want to uh, have your assets as, you can just have all of your resolutions at once. So these come by default, but you can add as many as you please. Uh, name them and assign the proper pixel size and just click on export. It's just going to be creating a, a, a sprite sheet and an XML file. Uh, and once you go into Unity, you'll just open the project. There's a certain, a couple of steps to do, but it's very easy. And what you'll see is exactly this animation. This means that if you had something to modify in your animation, you can just reopen your Harmony scene, uh, modify it a little bit, redo the export, but you don't have to redo the import inside Unity. You just have to relaunch your Unity uh, game and you'll see the changes already. So be it you know, color change once again with the easy uh, palettes or anything else, right? So I actually have this game in here. So let me check where did I put it? I've put it uh, I think it's here gaming <laughs> okay Just turn off my sound. So practically everything you see has been done in Harmony. Something else that I haven't mentioned is that we opened um, we opened um, the doors to using OpenFX. So this means that any OpenFX that you see online that you would have access to can be used in Harmony as well. So this just breaks the barriers that you could have in terms of compositing. Um, and there's a, lot, a little bit of other assets in here, but I won't keep on playing the game. I just wanted to show you what it looked like. All right. So now let me go into Storyboard Pro and do a quick overview and then go for questions. So I have a project here that has a couple of scenes, a couple of 
panels in each scenes. You can see that you can also have 3D assets just like you can in Harmony. So let me introduce you to it. So here you have your timeline and you can have only one video track, but you can have as many audio tracks as you please. You'll be able to, um, let's say that I am, um, I'm just at the beginning of my storyboard and I have a script. Maybe I have a script that comes from Final Draft. You can import it. And for those of you who know uh, Final Draft, it would just auto-populate every caption, every caption box here with uh, the, the, the things that you've done in Final Draft. But if you just have a, um, a regular document, text document, you can just copy and paste it in the script section and bring in the specific uh, text, basically, and just bring it inside the proper top nail box or uh, panel that it's associated to. Let me just turn off something. Is there something that keeps covering your microphone? Okay. Sweater or something. All right, now something else that you can do. So basically while you're doing your storyboard, instead of having to do all of the board and not see the timing of, of the things, well, and then going into an editing software and doing the timing, well, you can do it all in here as you go. So every panel you can just pull on the side change the timing of things. You can even change the timing in between panels without affecting the rest of the scene. As I said, you can import uh, sound. You can, as you can see, uh, mo modify the volume, play with maybe splitting a, a soundtrack or, or, um, or a video track as you please to move things around. You can import your FBX once again. You'll be able to create multiplane in here as well. You also have a 3D camera that allows you to rotate around your scene. You'll be able to also add um, transitions in between your scenes if you wanted to have some. So the transitions are limited in the software just because it is not an editing software. It's really just the storyboarding software that you'll use. So we have four different transitions. So it's really just, uh, it serves as a placeholder and um, for the future transition that you'll be putting in your final editing software. And also it helps you to, let's say that you have a presentation to do with your storyboard. Well, at least you can show exactly where a transition would be to your crew. Now, this allows you to also work in teams. So you can uh, work with the project management. Let's say that I am the storyboard supervisor. I could decide that the main storyboard is done, but um, I still need to have some of the scenes need to be worked on by my artist. So I would extract scenes from the board. I would send them to the artist. The artist would then turn on the auto tracking mode and wherever they do, let's say corrections. So let's say I want to add something, whatever, whatever it is, sorry. You see that wherever I do a change, the panel gets highlighted. When I then send it back to my supervisor, they would go and go into uh, validate changes. And this box will bring them to every single highlighted panel. They can choose to validate it, which makes it not highlighted anymore, or to not validate it. If they don't validate it, they probably want me to do a revision on it. So they could use something, uh, a tool from the tool presets toolbar, and I'm just using the revision brush, which creates an additional revision layer uh, to indicate anything. They could also decide that drawing on the panel is not what they want. So maybe what they would actually want is to add a sketch caption. The sketch caption will allow them to draw in here directly. And if that's not enough to give me indications, they can also record their voice uh, to tell me anything they need to tell me. And then the artist 
will redo the work and back and forth like that until everything is validated and approved. Once it's approved, you can also export it to multiple things. The main things are CSV, which creates a, a file that is basically a data tracking file. So it's something that will be openable in Excel and I think other softwares, but basically it will have, it will show every name of every single panel, every single scene, the timing of everything, the name of all the layers that are in it. It will show whether the camera is static or dynamic. So whether it, it's static or it moves, um, it will show basically everything. Now, something else that you can do, the most common one really is the PDF, right? So we have a different, a couple of different profiles that uh, people can use to export their work as a PDF. I can just give, show you a quick result of that. Oops. So does anybody in the audience do a storyboard? One person. <laughs> So if I look at my storyboard, by the way, I could not um, hear an answer to the question, so I don't know if you've muted yourself or if you've just not answered. But here is the board that I extracted, and it will basically render one image per panel, okay? So per panel that I have in my scenes. Now, for things where I have um, yeah, so for things where I have a big camera move like that and the camera move is so big that I'd actually like to show a couple different, um, sorry, a couple different images for these panels. Well, that's what the blue flags are for here. So basically I would like to add a snapshot of this specific frame into my PDF export. So you saw how quickly and easy it is to do so. Uh, by adding the blue flags, the snapshots, it will basically create extra frames of um, that panel and at that specific frame. You can also export as a movie. You can export as an XML, which is something that you would open in um, Premiere, let's say, and for the final editing. So you'd, you would be done with your animatic. Then you would move on to the scene planning and like uh, animation phase and then go export all of your scenes from Harmony and bring them back to Premiere. And basically, you would want to bring them back and stack them on on top of a previously created animatic that you've then brought um, into Premiere. So this is what you would use the export to EDL, AF, and XML for. Export to soundtrack and then export to Toon Boom. So uh, this allows you to bring every little thing that you see here into a Harmony scene and go right into, let's say, animating, right? So everything will be exported, the camera move, the FBX files, if you have any, everything will look exactly the way you see it here. If you wanna see what it looks like really, I can show you, just ask me. And the last thing that you would also do is export to FBX. So uh, Harmony is really used for 2D productions, um, whatever type of 2D, and also 2D, 3D integration. But Storyboard Pro has been used in many uh, types of different features. So um, animation, but also live action. Like, I don't know if you know the TV show Hannibal, but it's been done, the storyboard was done in Storyboard Pro. We have a couple of uh, shows like that or movies that use this. So um, let's say that you were working on strictly a 3D, so uh, a 3D production, you still be able to use Storyboard Pro, and then what you would want to do is export to FBX so that you'd be able to um, have the camera move and the proper position for all your 3D elements inside your 3D software. Um, I think this sums it up 
pretty nicely. So I'll now be available to answer any question. Thank you. Can you can you hear me now, Matisse? Okay. Oh, you were muted. My bad. <laughs> I'm Thanks. Sorry. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I'll open it up to questions now. Does anybody have questions about how this impacts their own work? Yes, from Storyboarder. So that was does Harmony export to Photoshop and Illustrator files? If it exports to it? Yes. Um, I'm. I mean, depending on yeah, the answer is yes. Um, if I go into Harmony, what we use to export is a write module. You can have as many write modules as you please. And in here, you'll see what it's going to export to. So you'll see that PSD is in it. Um, what is Illustrator? Is AEF or something like that? Uh, I don't think it's in it, but. Is that, and, is that and, what you said? Sorry? AI. 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 Right. So it is not in it. I don't have the answer for that specific question regarding exporting to Illustrator, but let me ask. And um, this presentation has been recorded, and I'll send this to Lindsay, and I'll also send the answers to your questions that I couldn't answer. So let me write that down. I create a lot of artwork for animators to do mm -hmm. a lot of the animated sessions and after effects. Okay, yeah. So it's kind of how like if I started to create artwork in harmony. Yeah. Because it looks like it can do a lot of the stuff I'd like to do. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. Um, and it's kind of a crossover between Photoshop and Illustrator. Yeah. Would I still be able to get those files to for animators to use? Uh, using uh, do so we? Using mm -hmm. uh, and the so Matisse, it's, I don't know how much of that you heard, but it was regarding After Effects as well. Are we compatible with exporting to After Effects? Okay, I'll. Uh, well, yeah, we are. What kind of um, what kind of extension are you looking for, though? Um, well, it's just to use um, kind of to create the artwork in Harmony, but if I have to pass that on to an animator who is animating in After Effects because they weren't using Screen Team, you know, would, would that workflow work? I couldn't hear, so Lindsay, can you tell me? Okay. If he creates the artwork in Harmony, can he pass it on to an artist in using After Effects? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I've done it myself. Okay. We'll find out some of the details on how that works as a pipeline and, and send that as a follow-up. Uh, and then show me we'll be able to circulate the link um, uh, for this session. Does anybody else have a specific question about how they how they work? Yep, we've got a couple. I'll take that one over there. I was wondering if there's an equivalent in Harmony to between contrast. To the between what? Contrast, sorry. Tween? Um, uh, between point A and point B, ten frames apart. Okay. Oh, like. ah, okay. So, um, Matisse, what's the equivalent in harmony to uh, betweens in Flash? So you choose a point A and point B and right. fill in the, the gap. Yeah, so basically that's how um, cutout animation is made. So let me create this fantastic, very high-end square drawing, and I'll show you exactly how you're going to animate. You'll see it's very, very easy. OK, so let's, kind of so let's say that this is what I want to animate. As you can see, I have the artwork, and I added a peg on top of it. Now, it shows up also in my timeline. All right, So I'll just bring it to the first frame. And I'll also extend the exposure of the drawing. As you can see, it's only at frame one by just clicking F5. OK, now using the peg, I am also going to place the pivot position. 
and position my peg. Now, if you look at the timeline, you see that it created a keyframe because I've moved it. So let me go further down the timeline, move it somewhere else. Now it created another keyframe. I'm also going to bring up my timeline toolbar, and I'll create a tween in between this. So by clicking on set motion keyframe, you can see that there is now a line on the timeline, which means that it's being tweened. Um, when you first tween like that, it will basically just um, create the same spacing in between each position. So it's a very regular, let me just change my preference of the onion skin. Okay. So it creates a very, uh, the spacing is the same everywhere. Now, if you want to add a little bit, bit of punch to your animation, what you would want to do is add some ease and an ease out, right? So this is also very easy to do. You click on set ease for multiple parameters while being on a keyframe, and you get this little graph. So what you see here is basically the representation of your timeline. So I'm currently at the first frame. I see that I have a keyframe. That's correct. And I see that about at 21, it's not very precise in here, but about at 21, I have another keyframe, which is proper. If I am to pull this way, it means that the position that uh, is on number one is being held for longer before it goes into 21. And if I am to pull the other way, it means that it will quickly jump out of this position. So I can show you by just clicking on apply and you can see how the spacing rearranges itself. Okay. And I can also go to my next frame, my next keyframe and create some spacing there as well. So now that this is done, we get something that feels a bit more alive already. And a beautiful square. Yeah, a beautiful <laughs> square. Then the last right. thing that I'd say is um, uh, not everybody wants to keep things uh, on ones, right? So a new position for the drawing for every frame. And you can simply very easily apply uh, keyframes on different uh, frames, basically. So you'll click on create keyframes on. And the most basic the usual things that people do is uh, having a new drawing every two frames, right? So here you decide, I want a new key on every what amount of frame. I'll keep it at two. I'll click on OK. And you can see that it converted my tween to key, key, um, key positions with exactly the same animation. If I had picked another number, it would have done exactly the same thing. Okay, great. Thank you. We've got one more question. We'll take that. Yes? Um, so all this exporting to Unity, can this be done in Harmony Essential? Uh, can exporting to Unity be done in Harmony Essential? Yes. I don't know that one myself, Matisse, do you? Yeah. Yes, it can. Um, actually, uh, Harmony Essential is the the version, the edition that we use for introduction to um, to animation, or for smaller um, for productions that have a small a smaller need, you won't have access to the node view in there, uh, but you'll be able to do things in the timeline. So yes, you'll be able to export to Unity in any edition that the software provides. Fantastic. So what we'll do is um, I can take any other questions you have for Matisse and, and we can uh, stay in touch. Uh, and then any questions you have regarding compatibility, a lot of them uh, will have specific videos and, and instructions online too about how exactly you, you want to maintain file uh, compatibility throughout your pipeline. But um, I think for now, Matisse, unless there's anything else that you'd like to share, it would be nice to, um, to thank you and to stay in touch as well. Um, sure. I mean, I, there's one thing that comes to mind that I haven't shown about 
paperless. It's like a little feature. Um, so if you guys are interested, I'll just demonstrate. So what I haven't shown is something that is called Shift and Trace. Um, I, it's something that has a similar name in Flash as well. And basically, it will allow you to have, let me just find my drawing, to send, um, I'll just show you. But basically, it will allow you to, to um, tweet, tweet. Okay. to have as many drawings as you want on the, what we call the desk, okay? And by turning on the onion skin, you'll have control, access to the controls related to the shift and trace. And basically you would use the shift and trace feature, let's say to check your volumes, okay? So um, consider this uh, as the same thing that you would do when you do traditional animation, when you lift off your your paper from the peg bar and you move it on top of other uh, drawings to check if the volumes and uh, proper uh, proportions are okay. So if you want to be able to do that and then put it back into place, so without actually moving the drawing, that's when you would use the shift and trace tools. So by using it, I can, let's say, rotate. I can uh, manipulate this. And anything that I do with the drawing tools are actually modifications, right? So if I am to maybe check if uh, this space is proper compared to like the other faces, and maybe I wanted to like add details just to show you what it does. And just to be very clear, I'll rotate it completely here. Well, if I am to go back in the camera, you'll actually see that no drawing has changed position, but the changes have been done. So once you're done with the feature, you can just remove the drawings from the desk. And you have to do that to be able to do anything else in the software. Um, this is also used to, let's say, reposition a lot of drawings uh, somewhere. We have this thing called reposition all drawings, and this will move any drawing that is in that uh, part of that drawing layer and expose on the uh, timeline. So let's say that I reposition this drawing. Well, you'll see that the other drawings under have been repositioned uh, as well. But sometimes, people would use this tool combined with the shift and trace feature to actually uh, select the specific drawings that they want to move. So let's say that I have 10 drawings and I actually just want to reposition drawing one, two, three, but with the same amount. Well, I would go to my drawing, I would bring drawing one, two, three to the desk, okay? And I would use the reposition all drawings to move these. So if I was to just do like just one and two, I'll move them, okay? And you'll see that one and two have been moved, but not, not number three. So yeah, that's pretty much what I had in mind. <laughs> Fantastic, there's so much it can do. So thank you for giving us a really comprehensive look and uh... We'll follow up, but if we if we clap loud enough, hopefully you can hear us. <laughs> Thank you. Well done, Matisse. I'll be in touch tomorrow, and um, have a good evening and afternoon. All right, you too. Enjoy it. Okay, thanks. Bye. Bye.